Welcome to our online session on computer hardware. Today we're going to talk about the physical components of the computer that we use so much. The definition of a system is that it is a collection of subsystems that work together to make a whole. Subsystems work together to produce a product or perform some function. The human body itself is a system. It's made up of numerous subsystems, such as the skeletal subsystem, the circulatory subsystem, nervous system, digestive system, and many more, all working together to be you. Our university is a large system composed of an administrative system, a academic system, maintenance system, and others to produce brilliant graduates like you. A computer is another form of a system made up of numerous subsystems that we will be discussing during this series of online lectures. Today, the subsystems we will examine are all related to the physical components that are necessary for us to have an effective and efficient computer. Basically, a computer is a system that with its subsystems performs the function of processing data. Before we start looking at those hardware subsystems, first let's take care of a couple of very important definitions. The bottom line is that the function of a computer is to process data. So what is data? Data is text, numbers, graphics, sounds, and videos that are entered into the computer's memory. While data may be all these things, it may not be useful in its original form. It would have to be manipulated somehow to make it valuable. Information, on the other hand, is data that has been processed in an organized and meaningful way. Note that the key word in that last line, processed. You might say that data is to information as hamburger meat is to a Big Mac. I hope Ronald will be okay with me using one of his important products to make this point. All computers have four basic functions. First, there must be an input function to get data into the system. Once the data has been entered, a process must occur to make that data useful. After processing, there is always an output function to present the results of processing. The fourth basic business function of a computer system is storage, through which the information is retained and protected until needed. In this lecture, we will discuss the computer system and its components in terms of these basic functions, input, process, output, and storage. So why don't we begin with the most common input device that almost every time we sit down at a computer we use, the keyboard. The keyboard as we know it was invented about 1910 and is still used today in some variation or other. The one most commonly found is the one known as the QWERTY keyboard because of this set of keys right here. We're talking about a piece of equipment designed over a hundred years ago still being used on modern state-of-the-art equipment. And this thing presents problems for a human being. If one were sitting at a computer and raised her hands to the keyboard like a normal human, the hands would be in this position. Notice that one's hands do not come up straight. Try it sometime just by standing and raise your hands to your waist. You'll find that they are naturally pointing inwards. In order to use this keyboard, one would have to twist her hands like so. This is not normal. This is, in fact, painful. This can lead to a well-known disease carpal tunnel syndrome. One option that helps ease the problem is to use an ergonomic keyboard. This keyboard separates the left and right hand keys so that they are in a similar alignment to the human's own hands. Most of them even mount those keys on a small mound because the human hand is rarely flat, but slightly angled. Ergonomics, considered human engineering, is the study of the relationship between workers and their environment, especially the computer they use. Another device that aids us with the input of data into the computer is the mouse, which probably ranks as the second most common input device that we'll be discussing. The popularity of this tool is the result of an evolution of the operating system user interface from the command line interface to the graphical user interface or GUI. Instead of the long learning curve to become proficient using the operating system that is characteristic of the command line interface, the GUI allows us to learn very quickly how to use our system. 
Its use of graphics such as the disk icon to save, trash can icon to delete, and the like make it very easy for a user to get up to speed very quickly. We'll learn during our video lectures on the history of the computer about Doug Engelbart, the inventor of the mouse, and the research on the graphical user interface that took place at Palo Alto's Research Center, Xerox Park. This video is being created with the help of this input device. I'm actually using a headset with a mic. Of course, you know this is the scanner that lets one scan documents, photos, and other items into the computer system. Imaging has become a very important element of information technology. As an example, during registration at many hospitals today, your information that you may note on a form is immediately scanned into the information system allowing all care areas, technical areas, and insurance processors to immediately have access to the information they need to ensure that you receive prompt and quality care. In many cases today, the scanner, printer, and fax machine are all built into one. That would make such a device an input and an output device. Does this look familiar? When I was a young guy going to the grocery store, the person that checked us out, usually a lady, was without a doubt the most highly trained and highly paid staff member in the store. Back then, she took the cans off the counter. She would enter the price into the cash register and put them into the bag never once looking at the keys on that cash register. Understand that the only thing she did was input the price. At the end of the shift, she would print out the cash register transaction list and a summary of sales. There was no inventory control taking place, no general ledger being updated. She simply checked the customers out. The barcode that you see in this image has drastically revolutionized the point of sale at all retail businesses. First of all, it does not require a highly skilled cashier. After all, how much skill does it take to drag an item across a scanner or pick up a gun to scan the code? Some of us do that ourselves at the self-checkout lines at Walmart and Sam's. This new system not only checks the customer out, but it also updates the inventory, posts the transaction to the accounting system, and possibly even contacts the vendor to order replacement merchandise. The barcode and the required barcode scanner are examples of tools that have enabled significant improvements in business management. Here is another image of a barcode, or universal product code, and this one is called a QR code, or quick response code. This QR code originated in the automotive industry. Today you will see it in a number of different places such as magazines and posters and possibly even your classroom. Our smartphones today have apps available that can read these things, allowing your smartphone to take you to some related website or provide you with additional information. Why don't we take a break here at this point so that you have an opportunity to kind of review the material we've covered so far. And then when you're ready to come on back, we'll continue on with this series of lectures.